It's a, it's a beautiful deception in a lot of ways. The Bible says he comes at us uh, not like we think he does, that he comes at us disguised as an angel of light. And so there's the enemy, his MO is, is lies and deception, and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. And when we believe these lies, when we buy into the deception and his schemes, the Bible says it creates what the Bible calls a stronghold in our life. It's an area of our life that the enemy has a strong hold on. It's when we believe a lie. And what happens when we buy into it is, is it prevents us from walking in God's presence, God's power, God's provision, and God's promises. It robs us from God's very best when there's strongholds exist in our life and we fall prey to the schemes, the plans, the deception of the, of the enemy. So in this series, we've just been kind of exposing these deceptions, these lies, but also kind of kind of attaching with it the how to combat, how to fight, how to win spiritual warfare with a study as well of the um, armor of God from Ephesians chapter six. So without further ado, if you need to catch up, catch them all online. There's, there's three of them already. Today is part four. Here is the lie, the scheme, the deception we're going to expose today that the enemy would want you to believe this lie right here, that God can't be trusted. God can't be trusted. Now, this was actually the very first lie Satan ever told was this lie right here. It was in the Garden of Eden where, where he, this, the devil comes to Eve and he says, did God really say that you can't eat from all the trees? Oh, he said you die. Oh, that's not what he's, God's not telling you the truth. He's just, he's withholding from you. He doesn't want you to be like him. God can't be trusted. So from the very beginning, this was the first lie that Satan ever told. And so from that lie, this lie has permeated all of humanity for, for all of existence that God can't be trusted. And when you say it directly like that, and you look at it like directly like that, I think all of us at, at first glance, we, we think like, well, I'm, I trust God. I trust God, but the enemy works in very subtle ways. I want to show you how quite possibly we have fallen prey to this deception where in subtle ways we're not trusting God in areas of our life and believing the lie of the enemy that you can't trust God in that area of your life. Jeremiah, a prophet in the Old Testament, actually had the same struggle going on, the same kind of inward turmoil that many of us struggle with. He says this in Jeremiah chapter 12, Lord, if I argue with you, you're always right. I know you're right. I know you're right, God, but that's where we, that's where we get in trouble. I know you're right. And I know you're working for good. And I know, but, and if I even tried to argue with you, you're right all the time, but I don't get it. Tied to God. I just don't, I don't get it. Can I tell you something? The problem's in your butts. <laughs> That's a whole other message right there. I wanted to say that. I wanted to say it. So, okay, so this was, this was, Jeremiah says, you know, if I argue with you, you're always right. I know you're always right. You're a good God, but I want to ask you some things that don't seem right. Has anyone ever been there, okay, where you have this, I, I know you're good, but... Talk to me. This doesn't look right, God. Why are wicked people so successful? Why do people you can't even trust have such easy lives? This is Jeremiah's butt. You have a different butt than Jeremiah. So, aha, see, your mind is in the wrong place over here. I heard you. You have put these wicked people here like plants with strong roots. They grow and produce fruit. With their mouths, they say that you're near and dear to them, but in their hearts, they are really far away from you. Have you ever felt this before? Where you say, God, I know you're always right, but it doesn't look right. This doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem right. I don't understand it. I can't see it, God. And I want you to see today, what I want you to see is that it's in those moments of that disparity that we see and feel that the enemy comes and whispers into our ear, hey, God can't be trusted. Oh, if you do that God's way, it ain't going to work out for you. Oh, if you, if you tr no, God, no, you don't. Don't obey God in that area of your life because that's not, it's not going to work out for you. And I know a lot of us feel like we trust God, though. So let me kind of 
Let me show you the subtle ways where doubt shows up into our life in very subtle ways. Write these down really quickly. Let me just fire through these because doubt shows up in our life where we're not trusting God when we solve our own problems. When we, when we just take control of our own problems, our own issues, we say, we, it, it proves that we're not trusting God. We're not surrendering the control. We say, I got this. I got this. I'll, t- I'll take this one. And if you don't involve God in the problems that you think are solvable, listen, you won't allow him into the unsolvable problems of your life either. Okay? But doubt will show up when we try to solve our own problems or when we hide our own hurts. We hide our hurts. So we're not honest with God. We're not honest with people. We're hiding our hurts because we really don't believe he's the healer of our hearts. If I bring this to him, maybe what's going to happen? So we hide it. We believe the lie of the enemy. We hide our hurts. Or we ultimately, really, we don't believe he's working for our good. We don't believe that he's working for our good. I mean, I know you're always right, God. And I know you're the, I mean, the Bible says you're working for my good, but I don't see how this is good for me. I don't see how it's working out that way for me. So ultimately what we do is we just don't turn to God at all. We don't turn to God in that problem. We don't turn to God in that situation. We don't put our focus, our attention. If you've ever had these thoughts, these doubts, this mixture that Jeremiah kind of has where I know you're always right, but you can become what I'm calling today an unbelieving believer. An unbelieving believer believer, where you have a little bit of both inside of you, where you know he's right and you know he's even working for your good, but you still don't think it's going to work out good for you still. If that sounds like something that you struggle with, if it sounds like something you're struggling with today in an area of your life, or maybe that you've struggled with before, then this message is for you today, dedicated to you. Mark chapter 9, we're going to study that today. In Mark chapter 9, um, let me set it up for you. Um, the, the disciples at this point are having a debate. It's a pretty heated debate with the father and some other religious leaders about this topic right here. Can we trust God? Is he going to come through? Is he supposed to come through? Was it, what's going on in the situation? We don't get it. And it's a really heated debate. And there's this mixture going on of doubt and trust. And Jesus walks up while they're in this heated debate. And he says, what are you arguing with him about? He asked. And a man in the crowd answered, here's the problem, Jesus. I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. And he said, whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I know what some of you parents are thinking right now. That's bedtime at your house. But this is a, different, this is a whole different scenario going on here, okay? I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but here's the key. They couldn't. I mean, they, they couldn't do it. There was, you, you, a guy, this guy, listen, this guy had a problem that was unsolvable. He had an unsolvable problem. And let me be blunt about this, you guys. If you don't have unsolvable problems, then you don't need an incredible God. Okay? Listen, we, we all, we had an unsolvable problem. That's why Jesus came to earth. We had the unsolvable problem by human condition, sin and death. It was unsolvable to us. Therefore, Jesus came and took care of our unsolvable problem of sin and death. But the fact is, all throughout our life, we will come up against unsolvable problems under our own power, strength, and intellect, and we need the God of the impossible to show up. We need it. There's going to be times in our life where we need God to show up. And this dad says, I have an unsolvable problem, but your disciples couldn't help. And let me tell you why this is pretty significant at this moment here. Because up to this moment, the disciples had a pretty good batting average. When they prayed for people, miracles happened. Up to this moment, they would heal, they would lay hands, and and they were doing pretty good. But then they come up to this son who has this spirit, and they pray, and it doesn't work. And now they're all confused, and, and they're having a discussion. Was it God? Was it us? Was it him? Was it the dad? Was it what's going on? Can, is, why isn't it working? Why isn't it working the way it's supposed to be working in this scenario? And they had this mixture going on. They became, in that moment, they became unbelieving believers. They had a mixture of, of I don't get it, and we've probably all been there. Every one of us have probably been there at one point or another. And Jesus tells them, he says, you unbelieving generation, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought 
him, the boy. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And he said, from childhood. It has often thrown him to the fire or water to kill him. And then this is a key statement here. But if you can do anything. Now, I want to kind of call to your attention and remembrance that at this point, the fa this father already knew Jesus' reputation. He already knew his reputation had preceded him, okay? So it wasn't a matter of like, if you can do it, this was a matter of, I don't know if you will. Like, I know you can. I mean, I know you raised the dead. I heard about that. I know that you healed people. I heard about that. I seen him walking around, the guy who couldn't walk. I mean, I know that you can do this, but I just don't know if you will for me. So if you can, you know, take, take pity on me, Jesus. And Jesus kind of resents this approach of if, what are you talking about? If you can, Jesus says, because everything is possible for the one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, and I want, then he kind of, he shouts this next statement. I want you to get this word exclaim though, because this is a key word in understanding the picture, the scenario. This word in the Greek is kradzo, kradzo. And, and, and that word exclaimed in the Greek, it means to shriek like a raven, to croak, yell aloud. So he didn't just say this next statement. He shrieked it. This was a cry of his, I want you to see the frustration, the mixture. I do believe Jesus, but help me overcome my unbelief. I mean, I believe, but I don't. I, I, I believe you, I mean, but I, I don't. Ah, ah. That's what's going on here. That's Kradzo. He's It's this mixture of belief and unbelief happening inside of his heart, the frustration of, I know you will, I know you can, but will you? And I think unknowingly that a lot of us have bought into this deception. And there's this frustration going on inside of us where we believe, but we don't. I mean, I, I know you can, but I don't know if you will. And I believe there's a piece of the armor that's going to help us out with this. But first, we got to understand where this comes from. How the enemy uses different circumstances in our life and times to whisper in our ear that you can't trust God. I want to pull out a few things from Mark chapter 9 of where this doubting faith comes from in this story. Write them down for me. Here's the first area where kind of doubting faith comes from. It comes from this area. Number one, that we believe like those around us. That's why we doubt. We believe like those around us. Has anyone ever noticed this, that you start acting like the people that you're around? Have you ever noticed if you're around people of strong faith, you feel a lot stronger, don't you? Or you get around people that have weak faith or no faith, you're like, I don't know. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen, right? You get around people that are all excited, you get all excited, right? You get around people that are depressed, you get, you get depressed, all right? You get infected by the people that you're around. You get spiritually infected, listen, by the faith level of the people that are closest to you. That's why it's so important for you to choose your friends wisely, because they are infecting and affecting your life. In Mark chapter 9, 19, Jesus simply said, he said, you unbelieving, say that word out loud, generation. He said, it's all of you, dang it. It's, uh, you all, it's be, the reason why you're doubting is because you live in a generation of doubters. There's just, there, you all doubt God. You're a bunch of doubting people. Everyone around you doesn't believe and is infecting you. Okay, and it's something for you to consider that even in your Christian faith, we can get to this place where we're in our, in our Christian culture that we believe, no, he can't. That we have this, this, I'll solve, we can solve our own, especially in America, we, we don't have any unsolvable problems. We take care of everything ourselves. So we have this form of Christianity that, that lacks the power of God in, in our lives, that we're solving all our own problems in this, and it was never meant to be that way. God was supposed to be demonstrated in power in our lives. And we can have this Christian culture where God isn't showing up. God is, isn't showing up at all because we believe like those around us in a generation where Jesus goes, man, how long am I going to have to stay with you? How long do I put up with you? How, long, how many times do I have to tell you? How many miracles do I have to show you for you to believe? Another reason why we doubt in this scripture that we see is that we've tried things and it didn't work. 
And that might be why you today even, some of you have a mixture today. Uh, that frustration is inside of you. That belief, but unbelief, because maybe you've tried some things and it didn't work. Like you prayed the prayer. You went up to the altar. You know what I mean? You, you went to the event or the conference. You did it. You read the book. You did what you were supposed to do, and it worked for them, but it didn't work for you. I tried some things, and it was supposed to work like it worked for other people. Now, but it didn't, it didn't work for me. It didn't work in my situation. So now the enemy comes and whispers and says, you can't trust God because you've tried some things and you didn't, it didn't work. In Mark chapter 9, this is where the father was out. Uh, it says, a man in the crowd answered the father, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. And whenever it sees him, it throws him to the ground. And he foams, he says, at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. Like I know it, you did it for other people. I mean, other people got healed. Other demons got cast out. And I don't want you to get caught up on this, on this father's situation of where he was lacking in trust of God, because it, that might, might not be your area where you need that type of miracle. But, but in areas of our life, there are, there are deceptions and schemes going on where the enemy wants to whisper into you, you can't trust God in that area. You can't trust God in your relationships. You can't trust God with your career. You can't trust God in your finances. You can't trust God with your children. You can't trust, and he'll get you to try to take back the control and leave it out of the hands of God and keeping you from God's best. That, that lie is keeping you from God's best. We believe like those around us. We try things that didn't work. And here's that third one we see from the scripture is that we believe that God is fickle. Some of us believe God is fickle. You know what fickle is? I looked it up in the, in the Webster's Dictionary. It means an unpredictable affinity for change. In other words, you don't even know it, and they change their mind. I just don't want to you know, do it anymore. It, I'm just not going to go. I'm just not going to do that anymore. How many of you ever feel like God kind of randomly chooses his people over others? Like it's some random thing that happens. You ever feel that way? Like, God, you did it for them. How come you're not doing it? For me, why does it work that way? And I think we can get into some very bad theology when we start thinking that God is fickle. That's where this father was when he said, I heard what you've done, but I'm not sure if you're going to do it for me. And that's why he asked the question in Mark 9, 22. He said, but if you can. I mean, if you can. I mean, I know you can, but I'm not sure if you're going to. And then he kind of begs God, please take pity on me. You ever done that before? You ever tried to bargain with God? Like, like, okay, God, you need to answer the first prayer request, so pretty please, pretty, 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 pretty please, God. And then I'll, you start bargaining, and I'll, I'll go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life, God, if you, right? We start doing these things. Like God's going to be up there and go, deal, deal. I like it. <laughs> Shake on it. Done, done. You're God, that's a good deal. Oh, wow, I'll take that deal. That's not, look, we're, we can get into some really bad theology when we think that God responds to bargaining, that you can manipulate God that way, that he's fickle or that he's random. God is not fickle or random at all, but I understand, you're not alone. If you've ever felt this way, you're not alone when you, when you say, God, I know you're, but when you have this kind of disparity, this mixture going on, we've all felt it, every one of us. King David uh, was in the same scenario in Psalm chapter 10, Verse one, not in your notes, but up here, you guys. He said, why, Lord, do you stand far off? Like, I know you're ever present help in time and need. Like, but you know, I don't feel like it. I feel like you're way over there. I don't feel like you're, you're here. God, you're not with me. And why do you hide yourself in times when I need you the most? In the time I need you the most, in my time of trouble, why are you not here? David, David believed one thing, but had some unbelief. And we he became an unbelieving believer like very many of us where we feel desperate. And we feel like God just doesn't care anymore. And I'm telling you, church, please listen, that that is a lie of the enemy. That is, that is a scheme and a deception. It is not true at all. It's the enemy's lie to keep you from God's best, from keeping you from, from surrendering the control and operating under the power the provision and the presence of God in your life. Here's the last one, why we doubt. I love this part. The reason why we have this doubt going on is because we, I put it like this, we kind of believe, right? I mean, I believe, sort of. I mean, I, I kind of believe. I'm calling it today straight up what it is. This is weak faith. It's weak 
faith. We have a faith level that has so much mixture of other stuff in it that it weakens it to the point where it's not even usable by God anymore. It's such a mixture that creates an instability in our lives that a lot of us are facing right now. You're facing this. Like, in fact, some of you are here today and you're kind of frustrated because deep in your heart of hearts, you know that God is still alive and he's working today. But at the same time, we have this other side that's getting bitter and more bitter because he's not working in your life the way you think he should work when he should work. And we become unbelieving believers, bought in to the lie of the enemy. So we kind of believe, and usually this happens, and what a result of this, what we, be, we become what the Bible calls lukewarm Christians, where we have, we're hot and we're cold. We have a little bit of both going on. So, so your work week looks different from your weekend, looks different from your Sunday. So you can come into here in church and you can put on a whole nother face. And it's not fake. You're not faking it. You truly believe that God is able. You believe it today. You believe it today. But then you go out there and the week happens and the world infects you and affects you and you believe differently. You unbelieve. And in Revelation, the Bible says that, that God with that hot and cold, that lukewarm taste, he, he, he spits it out of his mouth. He says, I can't even use that. I can't even use that mixture of belief and unbelief. We got to, listen, we have to get to this place where we get our faith and our trust in God hot again. That no matter the day of the week, no matter the problem, the situation, the challenge, that we would trust in God, who is faithful and able. We have to find a way to get it back to that place. In Mark chapter 9, 24, it said immediately the boy's father exclaimed, like, I do believe, but help me out with this mixture thing, God. I, I, I know I have it. Help me in this area of my unbelief. In James chapter 1, it talks about what happens when you have this mixture going on. Not in your notes, but James 1, 6 and 8, if you want to study it later up here, it says, when you ask... You must believe and have no mixture. You must believe and have no unbelief. You, you must believe and have no doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. He says that person who has this mixture of belief and belief going on in their life should not expect to receive anything from God. We're not usable. We're so infected and affected. Our trust, we bought into the lies. We're not even usable. Such a person is double-minded. And he says, it's unstable. I'm hot. I'm cold. I'm in. I'm out. I trust. I don't. I believe. I don't. Ah, croak, shriek. You know, this, this is what's going in all they do. So what do we do, you guys, when we get to this place of doubt, of believing yet unbelieving, how do, we get, how do we get our faith level back to where it's strong, it's real, it's authentic, it's on fire? Again, a kind of faith that God can use. There's a piece of the armor that I believe is going to help us in this area. And we've been studying Ephesians chapter 6 and, and, and taking each piece at a time. And Ephesians chapter 6 informs us to take up or to put on this armor to guard against the schemes and the deceptions of the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, is, is this piece of the armor I'd like to talk to you guys about today. He says, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now, now the re look, salvation here, don't, when we see this word salvation, we think of that moment when you got saved. Oh yeah, I have the helmet of salvation. I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm saved. I'm a, I'm a Christian. That's not the word. That is not the word. Look, it's not a one-time occurrence that happened. You know why? Because you don't have a one-time problem. You don't have a, salvation is not a one-time occurrence because we don't have a one-time problem. The word that's used here, it, there's actually other translations of it that actually say take the helmet of deliverance. It means deliverance. It means rescue. That, that's what salvation means. It's not a one-time thing, a choice we make. It's something we work out, put on every day. The, that, 
that we work out our salvation, that we are becoming like Christ and being transformed from glory to glory every day as we take on our salvation again, as we put on our deliverance, as we put on our rescue once again today. And he calls it this a helmet, that this, this part of the armor is, it, it, it is a, the protective mechanism of your head, right? So a football player wears a helmet to protect his head and his brain from the blows of the opposing forces, right? It cushions the blow of the opposing force. This, this helmet of salvation, of your deliverance that you're to put on every day, it guards your head, your mind, from the fiery arrows we talked about from the thoughts and the schemes and the plans of the enemy that has to pass through this protective barrier called your deliverance. Come on, somebody. That has to pass through. When I'm wearing it, it's, got, it's filtered through now. I am delivered. I am rescued. I am being saved. I am being transformed. That these thoughts are now protected. Yeah. Protected. My mind, my mind is protected by my salvation. That it just didn't happen one time. No, no, I'm wearing it and working it out every day. Day. That's what Philippians 2 actually says, Philippians 2.12. One translation says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This translation, a New Living Translation, says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Hey, spiritual growth is not automatic, church. Spiritual protection is not automatic, church. It takes work to put on the armor of God. Every piece to wear and put on and be equipped for battle takes some work. We have to work it out. Salvation didn't happen just once. It is worked out throughout the life of a believer as we become more and more like Christ, obeying God with deep reverence. Work it out, build it up, that as I put on my helmet, I'm not only protected, it not only protects me, but the helmet of salvation provides three things that I want to discuss with you today. Three things. Here they are. Number one, the helmet of salvation shapes what we believe. The helmet of salvation shapes what we believe. You see, my, my life perspective is filtered. Listen, it's filtered by my salvation. The challenges that I, that I come against, the, 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 troubles, the circumstances, the trials, it, it passes through the filter of this helmet called my deliverance. That I interpret life through, I am being delivered, I am being rescued, I am being changed, I am saved and am being saved. That I'm, it shapes what I believe. Paul says to Christians, listen, Christian, put this on, put on your helmet of salvation. Meaning you can take it off. Listen, you can be saved, but believing like you're not saved. You can, you can be a believer, but believe like an unbeliever. The reason why this disparity, this mixture, this frustration happens in our lives is because we haven't put on the helmet of our deliverance, that we're interpreting our life and the challenges without the filter of my deliverer my rescuer, my savior. It's, it's, it's the protective mechanism. It shapes what we believe. Proverbs chapter three, verse five. You guys know this verse, a lot of you do. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own head. <laughs> Don't lean on your own understanding. Put your trust in God and put the helmet of salvation, the helmet of your deliverance on. It shapes how we believe. It shapes how we believe. Here's the second thing the helmet of salvation does. It guards our thoughts. See, it starts at beliefs, but then your beliefs produce thoughts. And that helmet of salvation is the protective barrier. Listen, what the brain is to the body, and, and, and like I said, a football player will wear a helmet to protect his brain, all right? So he doesn't get brain damage. But the brain is to the body. If I tell my brain, go right, my body is going to follow and go right. What the brain is to the body, the mind is to the soul. Your, the, the, the helmet of your deliverance guards your thoughts. The reason why you can be saved but think like you're not saved. You can, you can be saved. You're saved, but you're thinking in your mind like you're not saved. Like you can think and hear like, oh, yeah, 
this is good, but then go out there and get infected and affected by the world is because you're not guarding your thoughts with the helmet of salvation. You're not protecting the thoughts and the schemes of the enemy. Ephesians 4, 17, Paul says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as those who don't know God live, right? As the gen- he's, he's talking again to Christians. Like you can be be- believers and acting like, thinking like, believing like unbelievers. So Paul's talking to Christians going, come on, guys, suit up. Come on, guys, put that on. Stop, stop thinking in the futility of their thinking. Stop thinking like you don't know Jesus. Stop believing like you're an unbeliever, thinking like you're an unbeliever. You got to put on the helmet of your deliverance, the helmet of your salvation. So the helmet shapes our beliefs. It guards our thoughts. And number three, it influences our actions. It influences our actions. See, the filter in which I react and respond to life, my, my actions is through the lens of my salvation, the lens of my deliverance. Without the helmet of salvation, I believe like an unbeliever, I think like an unbeliever, and I act like, a, like an unbeliever. Without Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, I'm going to read verse 5 again, but let me show you what verse 6 says. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And who will make your path straight? He will make your paths straight. You see, God is saying here, look, just, just put it on. Hey, you're not supposed to solve your own problems. You weren't supposed to work out your salvation by yourself. You weren't, no, no, no. All I need you to do is put your helmet on and I will make your paths straight. Just put your trust back in me. When it doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, doesn't seem right, just put your trust in me and I, he says, will make your paths straight. So if you're wondering why you're battling with this frustration today, with a mixture of belief yet unbelief and why you act in ways that are actually unbelief, it's because, listen, you're not wearing your salvation. You're not putting on your deliverance. Let me say it this way. You don't really have a habit problem. You have a helmet problem. Okay. You don't really, you don't really have a problem with the the way you act. Your problem isn't the way you believe, the way you think and and the way you act. No, no. The problem is you have, you're not putting on the helmet. Because if you were, if you were to put on the helmet of your deliverance and salvation, it would shape your beliefs. It would guard your thoughts and it would produce a different result in your life. It would produce different actions. Philippians says it this way as we continue. I read you verse 12. Let me show you verse 13 after this where he says, work hard. Come on, work out your salvation. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence. But check this out. Verse 13 says, for God is the one who's working in you, giving you exactly what you need, the two things you need to be changed, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God is saying, look, all you, 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 don't have, you don't have to change yourself. You don't have to try harder to believe right and try harder to think right and try harder to act right. All you have to do is put on my deliverance. Just put on my salvation and I will change you from the inside out. I'll change your desires and I'll even give you the power to do what I've called you to do. Just put it on. Just trust me, he says. Just trust me. Come on, let's, can we even do that just right now? Can we just bow our heads all across this worship center? And I want to start right there with some of us that have this mixture. We know it. The frustration is inside of us where we believe, yet we don't believe. Like we know that he can, but just not sure if he will And this mixture of unbelief is causing instability in some of your lives. It's causing a double-mindedness. It's causing a hot and cold where you can believe one moment and not believe another. And I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for God to just, to do something just new in your life, to set you on fire again, that you would not be hot and cold, but that you would be hot every day of the week, no matter the situation, no matter the, the, the problem that approaches you, that you would put your trust in him. 
surrender to him. Maybe you're here today and, and you've never done that. Maybe you, you, you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible just says that is salvation, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's it. You, this is yours. You'll get this helmet of salvation that will now shape your beliefs. It'll guard your thoughts and it'll produce results in your life, a different result. And it's not even something that you do. You don't fix yourself. God says, you just put this on, put on my salvation today, and, and I'll change you from the inside. I'll change your heart, your desires, and give you the power to live differently. For some of you, it's why you came today. With every head bowed and eye closed, you need this change, this transformation that Jesus can give. You need a new power for living. And with every head bowed and eye closed, I'd like to pray for you and with you. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but I want to pray with you some some words, just simple words to surrender the control of your life, to stop, to put your trust fully in Jesus today and declare him to be your Lord. Some of you have done that before, but you may need to do it again. Like you're living without him and he feels like he's far away, kind of like what King David was saying. Like, God, you feel so far and you're not here to help in my time of trouble. Maybe you bought into the enemy's lies and deception. I'm here to tell you today that God is the ever-present help in time of need. He's never left your side. He loves you unconditionally today. He's with you, and he's for you. With every head bowed and eye closed, though, if, you would, if you're ready for a fresh start, you're ready to take on a new name and a, and a salvation that Jesus has bought for you, I'd like to pray for you. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, do me a favor. Lift up your hand, lift it high, and say, Pastor, I need a fresh start. Um, I need it. Yes, yes. Leave it up. I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, 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 amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All over here. Yes, 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 yes. Praise God. Here, yeah. Amen. Amen in the back over here. Yes, yes. Praise God. Here too. Go ahead and put your hands down. Here, here. Amen. Put your hands down. Pray something like this. I want you just to whisper his name because there's power in the name of Jesus. Just say, Jesus, come on. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life to you. I give up. I give in. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. I declare you are my Lord and my Savior. You're in charge now, God. Come change my heart, my desires. Give me a new power for living God. Thank you for a fresh start, Jesus. God, I pray over every person right now that has this mixture going on today that have become unknowingly unbelieving believers, hot and cold, bought in in some ways to the deceptive schemes of the enemy. Maybe it's in the area of your relationships where, where, where you're not honoring God in your relationships because of a lie. You're not honoring God in your finances because of a lie. You're not honoring God at your work and your career because of a lie. There's somewhere that you have been deceived and a stronghold exists. And right now, in Jesus' name, we're taking captive those thoughts, those lies, and we're bringing them to the obedience of Christ that no longer will we be hot and cold, unbelieving, but filled with, with be belief and unbelief and doubt. God, help us to be hot, to, to put our trust in you in every area of our life, every day of the week, in every circumstance in trouble. God, we trust in you, and we invite you into every space. We love you. We surrender the control to you in Jesus' name. Amen.